All right, there's Steve. This worked. Wow. <laughs> okay, I think I'm just gonna sit here and we have this, this conversation that works well. Well, sitting in the fireside chat. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, when we met in 95, you were one of my first five VC meetings. And you will not believe it, well, uh, the number one question that I received uh, in 95 from all the Sand Hill Road guys was, yeah, but what are you going to do when the internet crashes? <laughs> so <laughs> it's, been, it's been, obviously, we've come a long way. Uh, but when I met with you, I remember you getting, talking about quantum computing and flying cars. You were always different, right? Uh, and what we see in, in your background here is a bunch of space artifacts because I think you're the largest space artifact collector in the world, pretty much. So I think we have a lot to talk about. So tell me, what? Please go ahead, go ahead, and, and, and tell me what, what 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 you remember from our interaction back in those in those days. Oh, well, this was not a question we uh, prepared ahead of time. So um, I do remember the incredible exuberance of the internet experience, and specifically our investment in TradeX and your pioneering work in a number of business domains was eye-opening. Right, like no venture firm had seen anything like this. It was unprecedented. Um, the prior precedents would have been things like shrink wrap software or games, um, which were both provably bad investments historically, you know, prior to the 90s. And so, you know, traditional venture capitalists thought this is a sector that doesn't fit in their frameworks. And it really took new entrants like ourselves and Tim Draper, my co-founder at DFJ, to say this internet thing is changing everything. Just like mobility that came later and a bunch of other things that came later, it restructures the way business is done in so many domains. We should focus on it. And it became, I think, over 80% of everything we did in the 90s. Um, I kept a few geeky investments, of course, on the side, as you mentioned, you know, optical chips and weird things. But the internet was like all in in 95 and 96. And it was thanks to entrepreneurs like you that really opened our eyes. Um, yeah. We don't figure these things out for ourselves. We learn from our entrepreneurs. And when you find someone like yourself decide you want to bet on your vision and your idea of where the world is going. And, you know, the secret is that's how venture capitalists learn, right? Um, the other uh, story I remember is you worked previously at, uh, at Next, uh, and Steve Jobs is clearly one of the other visionary leaders. And what always struck me is that story when you explained that Steve Jobs designed the sprinkler system at Next headquarters. What's the story there, and what do you think that tells us about visionary leaders that are micromanaging to that extent? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a colorful example. Uh, literally, the sprinkler layout was important to him, as well as the wood choice for the floors, as well as the staircase, every part about it. And it was a two-story building in Redwood City. And at the time, that seemed insane. By the way, fast forward to the Apple Store and the glass patents on, you know, and the, the aesthetic beauty that, that, that has unfolded there. And, you know, he's always had that sort of artistic flair. But I think the part of it that I found fascinating was that and, and I wrote an obituary uh, in Business Week for Steve Jobs, and I see echoes in Elon Musk and others, that, that for people like him, there is a literally a visceral agitation, almost a pain that they feel from visual imperfection. So with Jobs, it was the aesthetics of the product, getting rid of those ugly buttons, making it simple and sleek. He lived that aesthetic life in his house, this minimalist, like no furniture, or sit cross-legged on the floor. I mean, he was took it hardcore. This was his core yeah. being. But... I think what's fascinating about uh, product people, um, whether it's the abstraction of software or most visible in physical goods, is that they really care about the details. Yep. When I first sat with Elon Musk in the first, I, I own the first Model S, um, and it, he sat in it with me and, and he said, there's like 200 things I need fixing. And things I did not see, like the line between something on the windshield and some other piece of molding was like not perfectly straight. And he pointed these things out to me. I was like, wow, you really care about things, even things the customer might not ever see. And that's so much shared between the two of them. And I think it's frankly a passion for simplification of a product. In both cases, maybe a subliminal belief that if you simplify the physical thing, then it shifts all the value of the software and services. Yeah. And that really has been the success of the iPhone. So you've had a, a front row seat to the development of, of Elon over the last 15 years. And clearly, you know, it's just beginning. But from the time I remember you saying, you know, he's the most risk immune individual you ever met. He's always in, right, all mm -hmm. the time. 
And recently, I just came across a memo that mm. said, hey, we're having a bit of a hard time creating enough Raptor engines for the Starship, and we might face bankruptcy. I don't expect you to comment on the memo, but maybe on the thinking behind it. What, what do you think is, is, is happening when a company then that seems to be doing everything right, but behind the scenes, there are always things that in the situation is always more messy than it appears? Yeah, well, it's harder than it might seem. Manufacturing, scaling up. And I think this alarm, like some others that came before it, I believe is aimed primarily at employees to make sure that everyone realizes <clears throat> the importance yeah. of a current high priority item, right? So whenever a product has a P1 bug or something that needs repair, it be, I mean, he becomes all in, right? So there are famous yeah. examples in various books you can read about this of him, you know, sleeping on the factory floor at Tesla when there's a particular quality control issue or, you know, on Model X in particular, I recall. Um, and it really does galvanize a team like no other to have your CEO there all in the weekends talking to suppliers. No, I, because like, if, the C, if, if, the, if the employees right. start counting the stock option value, right, and, and lose track of what's really happening, you know, that right. uh, I think another thing is, you know, you can take enough vacations when we're bankrupt, right? Um, right. but, I, but I think the lesson is one of incredible focus, that there's something yeah. that is critical path to the next step. Like, we're going to colonize Mars, these engines have to work. Right. If all you were caring about was maximizing shareholder value, you'd say, wow, Starlink is doing great. Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, unaffected by any of this. Yep. All of our current revenue streams have no impact from whether Raptor succeeds or fails or is, you know, frankly, delayed is really the question on the table. But the mission of the company depends on this. And so this yep. is why there's a singular focus. I'd say like, like one of the most surprising things I've seen Elon in the trenches versus Elon as is publicly known is this focus on the critical path to the next step for the company because he is continually focused on the mission. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot to be learned there. Now, when you think of your venture investing career, what is it that you find compelling in a founder? What is it that you're looking for to say, this is somebody that I really am interested in backing? That's a good question. It, you know, the venture business, as, as I'm sure you fully appreciate, is hard to describe to others. There aren't any good textbooks that summarize, you know, the, the, yeah. the recipe. And so it's an art and it's a continual learning process. So the answer I might give today might differ, you know, year to year. So, but, you know, clearly a smart, you know, in, in my opinion, this might be a homophily bias, you know, high energy messianic kind of missionary who's like, gets me jumping out of my seat with excitement for whatever it is. And this, by the way, is included wastewater management to agricultural efficiency and fertilizer. I mean, things that I wouldn't have, you know, on first blush said, that's the most exciting field on planet Earth, but they get you excited about it. The same way Steve Jobs gets you excited about whatever he's at. So that's like, I think really important for employees, for customers. But I also filter for people who have enough self-confidence to be humble. And that sounds like a bit of a yeah. contradiction, but it's Not at all. so- That's exactly true. Some reservoir of, of belief in themselves so they can be open about what they don't know, yeah. right? And they don't think they've got all the answers. And that helps, by the way, scale a company that you hire the best functional leader for any given thing, be it sales, be it product management, be it what have you. You don't think you can do it all better than everyone else, right? Yeah. You hire clones of yourself and think you're the boss. That, that usually fails. So, by the way, a sort of a sub answer is I rarely invest in a singular individual. It's almost always a pair of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, really the rare the a particular founder, right? Like there's somebody yeah. on the side who's equally important, like a Jobs and a Wozniak. Like without Wozniak, Jobs would have been lost, right? Yep. And, and it's not just that you have these two diverse people, cognitively diverse, that is, um, who respect each other and build, you know, if you will, a good dynamic duo. They ripple out in the DNA of the firm to appreciate cognitive diversity. It's not like, oh, there's just one person in one personality type that's successful. There's actually diametric opposites, extrovert, introvert, you know, marketing, engineering, whatever it might be, that says we actually want to build a team of diverse individuals. And that, yeah. I think, relates with success. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, my slight disagreement would be that I believe there's the Chops Wozniak and there's always the one that finds another Wozniak, right? And Wozniak didn't find another Chops. So I think there's always one of the pair that I think is the one that that is attracting the talent. Yeah, right? the magnet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, is it a one-trick pony on the introverted engineer stereotype, if you yeah. will? But I agree, it's always hacker and hustler. That's the traditional uh, thing yeah. that I saw. Um, yeah, uh, see, and I, I was led to believe that venture capital is easy after watching my investors make 100 times their money. <laughs> and that was easy. It, uh, it certainly is not. <laughs> right. Now, you made it easy. 
but you don't invest in another scooter company, right? You want to invest in something that's truly new, something that right. you've never seen before. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, especially in the dot-com boom, I saw a lot of venture firms say, wow, I understand something, B2C or B2B, they were called at the time, and I'll just do a bunch of those. And it, and it frankly exploits the domain expertise. You're like, I understand a given business model, uh, you know, like today the enterprise software, the, you know, the metrics of you know, total customer value over the cost of acquisition, and you run know, all these you know, ratios and analyses, and you figure like, wow, I'm a smart investor because I can run the numbers, but so can every other venture capitalist. There's no differentiation. And so I've always had this belief that at least that as an investor, I should try to do something that the mainstream is not doing. And then that morphed really as a retrospective rationalization on my strategy. It's like, okay, what have I actually been doing for the past 20 years? It is to invest in something that is unlike anything I've seen before, one of a kind companies, yet adjacent to where I've been. So it's not a pogo stick like oil and gas, real estate, random crap like gambling that I know nothing about. It's like synthetic biology moving into, you know, cellular agriculture, moving into synthetic meat and other ways of manufacturing food. That progression is very logical to me. It's like I'm leveraging learning from one domain into the next, but it's an ever expanding frontier of the unknown. What is the next great technology wave? What is the next great area that's not currently overrun with venture capitalists? Um, yet I think we'll restructure the fabric of society and build a better future. Overrun by venture capitalists. <laughs> that's a good point. Um, and I would say that's definitely something that we're seeing a bunch of today. Uh, we've lived through uh, the last bubble together. And, and I would say I looked pretty smart by cashing out uh, a few years later, while your net worth has declined by about 80%, I remember you telling me. That's right. But you also At told me com. that After you the... never sell. That's right. right. Sorry. So sorry to interrupt. You, yes. No, I'm sorry. But you held through, right? And obviously, you came out looking like, smelling like a rose on the other side of that. Um, tell us about the mindset that enables you to go through that process and not sell, and not sell at the wrong time. It's, it's a great question. It was a wild epiphany. Um, well, rather, it was a precursor. My, my third day on the job in 1995, we met with some of their large limited partners, and one of them had been investing for the Rockefellers throughout his career. He was about to retire, and he told me two things. One, what an exciting time to be a young venture capitalist. This was just before the dot-com boom. And two, in retrospect, the one thing I would share that I wish I'd never done is sold anything. Because if I spent so much time and energy and anxiety on it, and if I just held on to Apple, I would have been so much richer, right, in the long run. So, in my personal case, I made a decision, I think it was about 20 years ago, to donate everything beyond a certain fixed amount to charity. And that was the precursor for saying, well, wait a second, you know, my kids aren't going to have some variable wealth based on how I do. It's like they're going to get like a house, right? And like enough for their education and then everything else goes to charity. So in some ways, you know, when I lost 80% of my net worth, as long as it didn't dip into their school budget, yeah. I'm like, eh, you know, the charity is really lost on this year with not me. Um, kind of a weird thought, but it helped me get through it. So I didn't like watch the stock price every day. But more importantly, and maybe to your question, I find myself thinking longer term. When I meet with an entrepreneur, I'm not saying when and how will I cash out to make the most money and time the market, because I'm never going to sell. In fact, I have a longer term horizon than some of the entrepreneurs we invest in. We made our venture fund, a 15-year venture fund. We're going to hold on forever, right? And the, the, money, the places already in my life where I've made the most money, I've held on for decades. And I find that that percolates back to filtering for the companies that are going to change the world if they succeed, you know, that'll be in the history books of the future and frankly make a dent in this universe that matters. And that is so much more fulfilling than right. being an arbitrage seeking opportunist to say, okay, is this ad network or that, you know, dot com going to make me the most money the quickest, right? And this is why, exactly. you know, we do a little in crypto, but not a lot. You know, there's certain sectors that it just feel like flash in the pan kind of opportunities to make a lot of money really quickly which you'd think would attract an investor, but I find is ultimately unsatisfying in the long run. Yeah. Um, and what would you tell founders in this climate on how to navigate this bubble? Mm. Knowing, that, knowing that we have this market dynamic right now um, in, in some sectors too much money, in other sectors too little money, how right. would you uh, advise people? I think it was Tom Perkins, one of the co-founders of Kleiner Perkins, who said the time to eat hors d'oeuvres is when they're being passed around. And it's kind of a quaint little aphorism of like, when the money's free, get it, 
right? And this yeah. is true in public markets, it's true in SPACs, which we can talk about. And it's certainly true in late stage finance, which is, is exploding. There's more money available, especially in deep tech and meaningful companies than ever before. But I don't even know if it's 100X. I mean, it's insane. Yes. It just dwarfs the dot-com boom, in my opinion. And it, like no, no company in our portfolio has any trouble raising money for a fallen round, for example. Yeah. And that I could have never have said before. Now, a crash will come. I think maybe the more important advice would be don't lose resolve if you have a major financial collapse. Now, I've been collecting some statistics for over 20 years now, by the way. And even though the Dow Jones Industrial Average keeps turning over, and it generally should, because the half-life of every public company is 10 years, by the way. So you're going to should expect turnover. Um, but on average, over 20 years now, two-thirds of the Dow Jones Industrial Average were companies that were formed during a recession. So there is nothing like a good financial crisis to be, this is the time to be building a business. So like when the last big one, and automotive companies are bank going bankrupt and financial services companies are going bankrupt, that was the time to invest in automotive and financial services as a startup, right? As you've experienced and as we've experienced with, with the automotive sector. It's like no better time than when something is changing business as usual. So maybe the more most important thing is if things feel freaky and weird in markets all around you, that's a great time to be starting a new business, takes advantage of it. Um, if you're already up and running, grab the money while it's available because, you know, this party may not last. Exactly. <laughs> it, can't, yeah. it can't last. It's so like when, I, you know, when, yeah. when I started in business, the 30 most valuable companies in the world, none of them today are on that list. That's right. right. It turned That's over. Really it turned important. over completely in my life, in my business experience, right? Right. So that's a that's a profound statement. So like it's easier in retrospect to see that, but the thing to keep in your mind is looking forward thirty years. It's going to be the exactly. same story. Yeah, and I think you know who knows whether it's going to be a zero that are going to be on the list, uh, but for sure it's not going to be the same thirty, and probably it's going to be maybe five or so that are going to be on that list, and probably there's going to be a couple that you and I are invested in that make the list. That's I yep. think what we are, are interested in. Um, and I think that one of them is probably SpaceX that mm -hmm. could become, you know, could make the list of the most valuable companies in the world. Uh, another one, if it works, Commonwealth. Right. I agree. What, no, what other, what other I of course, what other candidates would you say could become, could go on that list 30 years from now and become this, one of the 30 most valuable companies in the world? Well, that's a great question. So the, I almost wonder if, uh, you know, companies like Tesla and SpaceX are, you know, 30 years is a long time, right? It, the best answer to your question, actually, historically speaking, would be a company we could not name. A company doesn't yet exist. Yeah, it's, not, exactly. it's not even a glint in the eye of the entrepreneur. So I might say Elon's next startup, if there was one. Um, but I, I would say there's certainly domains where major value creation needs to come. So here's, here's maybe an interesting framework for your audience. One is it's pretty clear that Tesla dominates leadership in the automotive sector, right? And if Tesla didn't exist or had failed in yep. its early year, the automotive industry would not be where it is today. There wouldn't be a, a global imperative to shift to electric vehicles. That would not exist. It's really amazing if you let that sink in. Imagine there had never been a Tesla. Same with SpaceX. They have about 80% market share of satellite launch and going into 2022 of tonnage to orbit. Pretty amazing, but that's unheard of. So aerospace, automotive, totally revolutionized. I think what's coming is agriculture slash food production, like meat mm -hmm. manufacturing, if you define it that way, how do we manufacture meat? Construction, mm -hmm. totally right. And these are, by the way, trillion dollar industries that have been stagnant for about a century in terms of productivity per human labor input. I mean, it's insane, right? It's, I mean, it's sort of, agriculture certainly improved with, you know, for obviously fertilizer and GMOs, no doubt, but the actual act of how we physically plant things and grow them, and more importantly, how we do animal agriculture really hasn't seen disruptive change like ever. Um, so I think those are going to be like the sectors where I'd expect 30 years from now to be a company, I don't know which one, that will be the most valuable company potentially on earth or the most important company on earth, uh, saving us from our inevitable future, you know, making it a better future that we, that we inevitably see. Because if, if you look at 50 years, we will not slaughter animals for meat. We may eat meat, I think we will. We won't raise animals the way we do today. You know, all vehicles will be electric, all vehicles will be autonomous, you know, from cars to airplanes, right? That's obvious, like that. There's no, there's no debating that. Like that is not a debatable proposition. Right. It is a lot easier to yeah, look out further to figure out what's yeah. going to be than to mm -hmm. figure out what's going to happen in five years. Right? Exactly. Because you can't know you the direction are, that things like, are going to go and what innovation and enables. Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. That's and what I do. I think out what is the inevitable future and chain back to the present. 
because you, you aren't getting hung up with, oh, but what about the regulatory restrictions or what about, you know, whatever, right? You know, we won't be pumping oil and gas and burning it in these little cars all over our planet, right? These billion, billion, you know, vehicles that waste 80% of their gasoline as heat. Like that's insane, right? Yeah. Yeah, and right now we, you know, make about 5,000 aircrafts a year, commercial aircraft and 90 million cars. So you could actually pretty easily argue that the majority of all aircraft that will receive a new tail number will be electric not too far from now. Yeah, yeah once, once, yeah, once, you know that there's a, a core engineering challenge around the weight density, um, the gavimetric density of uh, batteries. But once that gets solved, whether fuel cell, battery, or what have you, it's going to be wide open. Yeah. Yep. Um, now, climate change, big topic for all of us. Yeah. I think we saw the co climate conference in Glasgow, and uh, a lot of people were quite disappointed with what came out of it. Do you believe that governments are going to figure this out on how to solve climate change through government regulation, or do you believe it's going to be entrepreneurs that are going to figure it out? Yeah, I, I, it, it is like... Mm -hmm. Few things I feel more confident about than there's zero chance governments will figure it out. And when I say they figure it zero out, chance. Means, zero chance. Zero chance. But like, it's not one percent. It's zero. And and what I mean by this is I don't mean literally figure it out like someone doesn't know what we need to do. Well, that's going to happen. Some policymaker, yeah. some advisor, sure, certainly. But will action be taken globally? And this is like beyond right. the regulatory question mark of any one country doing the right thing, like U.S. and China taking the majority of the burden because they created most of the problem. Like good luck with that, right? Like. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not a politician. That's partially why I give it zeros. I've never seen meaningful change in society led by government, except some social policy issues. It's not on technology policy. It's not on business policy. What happens is an entrepreneur. So even now, let's shift to the, to the private sector companies. Yep. There is zero chance the incumbents who created the problem will solve the problem. You know, forget Exxon, Shell, or any of those companies making any meaningful dent in our future, because the best they can do is do less harm. Right? They are not gonna lead the charge in any way. That, the reason is that's never happened in business in the history of the world, that a company that makes money off something as their core business revolutionizes that core business. Didn't happen in automotive, it won't happen in oil and gas, won't happen in the petrochemical economy. We will depend on new entrants as we always have, right? And that's okay, because in the past, those entrepreneurs may not have dreamt that big. Prior to Tesla, it may have seemed impossible for a startup. And I think, frankly, in the 90s, you think about yourself as an entrepreneur to say, I'm gonna, put out a business plan that requires a billion dollars of investment capital before, right. <laughs> and, you know, generating revenue. Like how many of those would have gotten an audience, right? No. Zero, right? But today, yeah. the Commonwealth Fusion, That's like you thing. just mentioned, and te I think Commonwealth Fusion in some ways was a beneficiary of tennis law because right, we can see that trillion dollar companies are possible. We can see that right. growth capital available throughout, you know, private and public markets to bring these world changing ideas to market as long as the idea is big enough. And I think now entrepreneurs are dreaming like never before. They're taking on the biggest challenges on our planet, including climate change, and they're going to solve it. Who else would you bet on, right? <laughs> it's been famously said, you know, that this has always been the case that a new entrant leads the future and makes meaningful change happen. And that's what we're betting on, you and I. And that's what I hope more of the investment community will bet on up and down the stack, because that's the only thing that will save the world. And it's the only thing that ever has. Yeah. The sky isn't the limit and, um, and trees don't go to the sky. But the compounding effect and how big these things can get and how valuable these companies can get in a fairly amount of, a short amount of time, that I think is what's staggering. And that I think is what really gets the creative juices flowing and also the animal instincts and really turbocharges bold entrepreneurs to fill up their gas tank, quote unquote, uh, with a ton of money and really work on the problems. I mean, because, you know, in Europe, I think we're thinking about deploying 750 billion on, on, on solar and wind. Yeah, and, you know, we definitely should do something, but I think we're going to be better off finding 10 or 100 Commonwealth fusions and give them a couple billion and say, you go at it and you figure out a solution that's going to give us carbon neutral baseload, because that's what we really need. Yeah. Exactly. And there's, by the way, as you know, it, it's almost a daunting number of inventions and innovations that need to occur everywhere from ammonia to, you know, cement, you name it. Right. And you could say, is a planned economy going to like tell us what to do and get the metrics right? Or is it going to be entrepreneurial driven to say we now have perhaps 
a bit of a moral imperative slash, you know, sort of mission that becomes more clear. There's nothing like a disaster to focus the mind to say, we're going to be able to hire the best people and build the best companies if we're actually solving the climate crisis as a byproduct of making money, right? So Tesla, for example, did not bring a worse business model to the table. They brought a higher gross margin card to the table. I would say you can't in business suck and lead. I mean, you can't say, hey, I've got this business that depends on subsidies and it's kind of an unattractive business and I want everyone to follow my lead. That's not gonna happen. You have to actually carve a sustainable future, which can be, as we've seen, a better future economically and of course for the planet. I think this was the perfect closing statement for the first day at NOAA which is all about sustainability and the entrepreneurs that can drive it. Thank you so much for dialing in.